Hello and welcome to this Code Rage session. My name is Stephen Ball and I'm going to be taking you through cross-platform secure database storage for mobile and desktop. So before we get going, a little bit about me. I'm one of the RAD sales consultants and also the associate product manager for Interbase and Barcadero. And if you'd like to catch up with me, then you can do on stephen.ball at embarcadero.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Delphia Ball and also up on the blogs at blogs.embarcadero.com. As we go through today, the, the synopsis really um, from this session is uh, around data storage being a critical part of any application. Uh, and especially as more and more business applications adopt mobile platforms. And this is something that I know a lot of us need to think about. And within the market today, um, CIOs are embracing bring your own device as a way to mobilize their workforce. But there's a number of risk factors that this brings. And um, till now, a lot of people have kind of shied away from putting data onto the mobile devices or storing it there for, for any period of time due to the increased risk factors. And, and we're going to be exploring that as we go through today and, uh, and the importance of needing to be able to get data uh, in a manageable way uh, onto devices. So a, a key part of this really is about how we can give you the edge uh, and make you aware of what you can do um, with your mobile applications and considerations you need to take into effect when designing up and looking after um, data storage uh, on the desktop and on mobile. So a few questions um, to be answered as we go through and a few things to look at. Um, why use local storage in an application in the first point? Is this something that we actually need to do? How bring your own device really mixes in uh, to the mobile world we live in today and what challenges that brings? Also, where do we need to worry about data? Um, it's probably actually a little bit further afield than you think, so we're going to explore that as we come through today. There's a very brief introduction to a couple of key roles that you need to identify within organizations to help, um, help them and to, to help you if you're selling your software into them um, to become aware. And that's the data processor and the data controller. So we'll quickly introduce those roles as we go through. And then we'll talk about what protection looks like and what it needs to be from both a, a requirements uh, and a conformance stance. Um, what do we actually need to be looking for? And finally, we'll be looking at how you can protect your data very simply everywhere. And uh, we'll be we're showing you how to actually do that in practice. So first of all, let's start with why use local storage in our applications? Well, it's the same reasons really that we've been using local storage on network um, devices for a long time. Um, it reduces network connectivity, uh, it improves concurrency to your central server, uh, it reduces mobile data costs, which is a massive part um, of the cost structure within the mobile architecture that we need to worry about as um, software developers because if we're going back and fetching the same data over and over and over again, then that really is going to ramp up the running costs of our software compared to others. So local storage is a very effective way of maintaining cost and reducing cost uh, as an, on an ongoing basis. Also, if you want to do offline data work, uh, and this is really where, in the enterprise, traditionally, it's been used a lot more. Um, if you're working on laptops, taking things out into the field, doing data collection, data analysis, data processing. The same things apply for mobile, though. Um, if you're on the train or if you're in the middle of the countryside where there's no data um, signal, or if you're in the middle of um, some huge concrete buildings, it's very often difficult to get uh, a mobile reception or certainly one that you can work successfully off. You know, there's a number of good reasons why you want to be able to use offline data for working. And, and a big benefit is around increased speed and performance, uh, obviously the scalability, but also the um, where you've got that data offline, you're actually able to increase your um, performance, 
not only in terms of the application speed, but as an organization in your operations performance and speed um, to, to be able to deal with customer requests and, uh, and get them promptly processed. So some of the, um, the challenges that come with local storage, obviously a big bit is about controlling where data is stored. Often you need to be flexible within your applications about where you want it stored. That can lead to either fixed or remote disks being used. Uh, if it's a removable disk, then this um, opens up the door for that data being inadvertently or um, avertedly taken and carried out uh, outside the organization. Um, now that exposes uh, risk that you need to be able to control, especially if you've got data that can identify people, customers, patients, uh, or whatever, you know, any data that can identify people is something that needs to be managed um, from a conformance point, from a legal point. So where it's stored on disk can be quite a challenge. But also we have the security over the wire as well. Um, so if you're communicating from a remote machine to a server, then you've got the network traffic to monitor and, and worry about. So you really should be using HTTPS um, or OpenSSL to be able to communicate with your servers to process data back and forth. Now, in terms of where bring your own device is really making a big change in the shift away from uh, traditional desktop and laptop architectures for, for networks is um, you know, we just look at this chart here and I'm sure this is one that if you've been on some Embarcadero presentations in the last year you may well have seen before but uh, the latest stats that I've seen up on the register um, talk about how um, the big blue area in the middle there windows uh, the Wintel area is down to about 30% of market share, 30%. So when it comes to the devices that are going to be connecting up, that customers are going to be wanting to use to communicate with your systems for processing data, you know, laptops will win out in the enterprise environment for the sheer volume of what you can do with them. But don't be fooled into thinking that mobile and tablets don't have a place, uh, even on products that you've had out there for you know, 10, 15 years. Um, mobile, we're seeing, is really taking a big chunk in because there's often things that you want to be able to do, you know, some small tasks that need to be constantly done, uh, that may be done on the road, um, where you need to just be able to turn up with your iPad, select a few things, process an order, send it back. We're seeing uh, a growth, a big growth in business to consumer and business to business applications around the mobile platforms. And one of the big constraints there obviously is data. And this is going to you know, completely continue. Um, smartphones are going to be moving up to about 78% of the global handset shipped uh, by 2016 according to Gartner. And if you look at the mix then iOS and Android uh, are maintaining their dominance through that sector. Um, they're predicting uh, Windows Mobile uh, will actually will grow into the mix uh, in the future as well. Um, but very much Android and iOS being a very, very big part of that. And if you look at the tablet usage as well, um, iOS is expected to maintain about half the market around the, the tablet usage, with the other half really being um, Android and a small sector for, for Windows Mobile and others. So bring your own device. It really is being embraced at the moment by, um, by CIOs. As you can see, there's such a, a growth in, in mobile and smartphones within the mobile area that by being able to give employees the chance to use their own devices, um, it increases their efficiency, uh, increases the flexibility they have around working. Uh, if they can process some of the common things regularly from wherever they are from their mobile, then it means the business gets a lot more uh, efficiency uh, and the employee's satisfaction actually is, is raised because they can actually deal with things um, as they need to or when they're on the train or when they're away from their desk. 
So when they get back to the desk, they haven't got this heavy workload that suddenly appeared from them. It gives them a feeling of a lot more control on their work. And bring your own device, really, you know, because everybody's getting them, uh, why spend out the cost as a CIO? Why spend you know, four or five hundred um, dollars a head to, to provide these devices out when, the, you know, when your staff are bringing them in themselves anyway? And who would want to carry two devices around? So it really is kind of just, it's, it has a lot of sense. And one thing that we're seeing is that, you know, different devices are being used at different times of the day as well. Um, mobiles tend to be used in the morning. Uh, I certainly use mine. The first thing I do in the morning is turn my alarm off on my phone. And then I kind of check the wife's asleep. And if she is, I can have a quick look at my emails. If not, I have to take my phone downstairs and make a cup of tea and then look at my emails. Um, but you, you get the chance... Um, because it's instant on, you can do those common things very, very quickly. Uh, it gives me a chance to reply to a few of my colleagues out in Australia if I need to at any point. And then through the day, I'll typically be working on my laptop. Um, I quite often have my phone in my pocket and if I'm walking around the office, I might check some emails between desks on my phone or something. But certainly in the evening, um, I find that's kind of peak time really for tablet use. Quite often be sat browsing the net on the on the tablet rather than on a, a laptop it's just so much easier and, uh, and, be, and be working on my tablet to do things so bring your own device really is coming in uh, we've already had a look at some of the local storage challenges and um, you know bring your own device really adds to the challenges around local storage because all of a sudden there's a blurring of personal and business data there's a device security um, consideration to be introduced um, where, where these devices are not owned by the company. Then you need to worry about the capabilities that are on those devices. There's certainly not a policy that you can implement particularly easily around mobile phone usage that your staff have if you're not uh, in some way controlling what they can use with their mobiles. So this really means that your applications need to have that security capabilities built into them because it's just too hard to actually have that policy against the hardware level. Mobile phones are probably the most stolen thing at the moment. Um, when you look at uh, what's stolen from pe uh, people personally, uh, certainly uh, I've seen reports where it's much higher than wallet theft. Um, because they're worth so much more and also you are much more likely to lose them um, and also what happens if they fail uh, if you've got um, if you've got stuff on the devices so they do raise a whole load of um, support challenges and one of the things that we've been seeing recently in the press as well is how much Android is being targeted at the moment by malware, uh, and in fact, there was a, an article out this uh, this last week, start of October, um, 2013, talking about how security analytics firms are refusing to actually mention a specific plugin that's being actively used by a lot of um, developers at the moment for displaying ads on Android, and they reckon there's over 200 million devices worldwide that have these um, this adware installed and they've 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 discovered some serious vulnerabilities that having that adware in your application brings for the ability to run remote scripts and you know this is a, a big issue that um, is now being identified uh, on Android and they're having to try and get fixed and sorted so uh, you know there is a big challenge and often things that you can't control around around external devices being used. Now, bring your own device really wrestles you with three key operational factors. I say governance and compliance, 
um, bring your own device could cause you to violate rules, regulations, trust, intelligence, um, property and other critical business obligations. Mobile device management. You need to be able to manage growing workforce expectations around mobility and your employees use many devices they expect to use any device or application anytime and anywhere and security what do you do if it's left unmanaged um, bring your own device can lead to loss of control impact your network availability and cause data loss and you need to you need the right access um, strategies and policies in place to secure your environment around security. Now, this is stuff, and um, these three key factors is something actually directly from the Gartner website um, from 2013. The link is at the bottom of the screen here. Um, so it's not just us saying this. This is stuff from Gartner, from, uh, from a number of series of organisations out there that you need to be looking at security specifically around your data with bring your own device and it's not just the typical areas that we need to worry about data um, obviously we've been worrying about it for years with laptops and um, but there's also kind of a range of additional kind of devices uh, with the tablets the phones external drives USB flash drives um, even data that's in you know, briefcases, you need to be worrying about data that's managed by your company absolutely everywhere. And you know, more and more we're seeing data on embedded devices as well. So when it comes to talking to organizations about your product, about data, about things they need to consider, when they're going through the, the sales process, or even if you're consulting with them um, about things they need to, to con they need to consider, there's really two roles that you need to identify. The first is the data controller. Now, the data controller is either somebody who works by themselves or with other people to determine the purpose for which and the manner in which any personal data is stored uh, and or processed. Now, when it comes to a data processor, now this is the typical role that you find. These are people who work with personal data by any means um, and isn't somebody who's the uh, an employee of the data controller. So these are people who are putting data in, pulling data out, analyzing data, whatever they're doing with the data, they're a data processor. The data controller is somebody who defines and manages the security roles, um, where data can be used, um, who can and can't touch the data. That's a data controller compared to somebody who uses it, which is the data processor. And it's important to identify these because um, these are key people, uh, especially the data controller, in, in the purchasing of software. Uh, and quite often you'll find uh, it's somebody from the HR department or from finance or they may even have a, a chief data security officer um, but these are all people that you need to identify so once you've identified the right people to talk to about data within the organization um, data protection is the key thing that you need to talk about so protection in simple means encryption uh, and typically it means 256 encryption uh, the standards within the US and the UK, um, uh, FIPS compliance, um, which which specifically target 256 compli um, data compliance, um, goes beyond just the basic encryption load. Uh, it really is a whole um, mantra to look at around data security. But data encryption, wherever you look worldwide, is being really pushed at 256 bit encryption uh, at uh, as the basic point. And there's a big misconception, um, and this is a nice one from Simon Rice, who works for the Information Commissioner's Office within the uh, within the UK. Uh, let's get this one out of the way first. A common misconception is that just requiring users to log into a device or service with a username and password provides an equivalent level of protection to encryption. This isn't the case. A password or a 
pin to control access to a device isn't encryption and it isn't enough to protect against unauthorized or unlawful access. In practice, a password can be easily circumvented and full access to the data can be achieved. So this is pretty key. This tells us that um, the enforcement agencies worldwide don't see just a pin or a swipe on a device enough of a security measure to protect data. And um, we'll have a look at a bit more of that and why that's important to understand as we go through in a moment. But basically, you've got two types of encryption. Apart from none encryption, that is. It's either full disk encryption, so you can get the disks encrypted completely, and there's a software options to do this. And this is perfectly fine whilst the data is on the disk. However, when the data has been removed from the disk, it's no longer secure. So if you have the ability to copy a file onto a flash USB drive, that's a security hole. Individual files is a much better way to encrypt your data. If the file is encrypted, it doesn't matter where it exists, if it's on a disk that's encrypted or if it's on a non-encrypted disk, if it's on a USB drive, if it's on a phone, wherever that file is, if the data is physically encrypted in the file, then it's encrypted. Now, this is quite interesting for compliance. You really need to encrypt now. Uh, and I've highlighted just a little bit from, from this website, from the ICO. In future, where such losses occur and where encrypted software had, encryption software has not been used to protect data, regulatory action, regulatory action may be pursued. So there's been a number of um, recent uh, incidents around laptops and personal information where it's been stolen, um, where it's been inappropriately placed and so on. And they're really, really kind of pointing out here that regulatory action will be pursued where the data is not encrypted. And I've got a couple of quick case studies I want to share with you here. The first one's Jala Transport Limited. Now this was a very small company, a one person company. They had a hard drive in a bag. Now the hard drive had an 11 digit password on it. The data however was not encrypted. He stopped at some traffic lights somebody stole the bag from his car window. He received a fine of £5,000 for the breach of data. Here's another one of a slightly larger organisation, the National Health Service in the UK. Now they had approximately 1,570 hard drives containing sensitive personal data didn't know how many patients were stored on the disks, it's very hard to tell. Now they had no previous breach of data. The drives were, they had to, they recovered some of the drives and the only way to get the data off them was using file recovery programs. So they, they had a good attempt at wiping the data. The data controller, however, received written assurances from the company that they provided the, the drives to for disposal that they would be physically destroyed. The data was not encrypted. Now there's some issue around the contract they had with the, um, the, uh, the people they passed the hard drives to. A number of the drives ended up getting sold rather than being physically destroyed. However, even though they had that assurance, there was a £200,000 fine. Now here's another one, Alaska State, a $1.7 million fine. Now here again, the key thing is a loss of an unencrypted USB drive that may have contained protected patient information. And because they didn't have safeguards in place, they ended up with a $1.7 million federal fine. Here's another one. Blue Cross Blue Shield, $1.5 million fine. Again, the key thing here, unencrypted information that was stolen. So they actually had 57 hard drives 
stolen from a data storage cabinet within their organization. But because the data on the drives wasn't encrypted, even though it was securely, it was you know, reasonably well stored in a cabinet on their, on their premises, they got broken into, it was stolen, they ended up with a $1.5 million fine. And they also had to agree a 450 day corrective action plan that inc included encrypting all at rest data. Now that's pretty serious. You know, who would have thought that having data on your premises in a cabinet locked up overnight that somebody would break in, steal it, that you'd end up with a massive $1.5 million fine. But it happens. But it's not just the cost of having the fines that really kind of hits an organization. Typically, once an organization has had a data protection breach, there is a churn of around three to 4% of their customer base. So if you've got 100,000 customers, that's three to 4,000 customers you will lose because of that security breach. There's the costs obviously around the regulatory and uh, uh, fulfillment side, but also around dealing with customers. You, know, you typically end up with have customer hotlines set up or um, abilities for customers to be able to call in. That takes time and effort. You may need to contact all the customers. You may end up finding that you have to offer discounts for future products and services to compensate the customers for the fact that their data may have been lost. And also there's a whole load of in-house communications and training that you need to do to help manage this breach. It really does have quite an impact against the company to have data lost, stolen through any means. So when it comes to local database storage for mobile, there's really two options that you have got today. There's SQL Lite, which is kind of a free database. It doesn't have any inbuilt security with it. It's single read, single write. It's a bit like, or I kind of term it a flat file on steroids it, um, because the data is stored into a flat file format um, and the data can be pulled out in a, in a number of different ways. And the implementation is different from device to device um, depending on the version of SQL Lite that exists and how the vendors have opted to integrate it into their platforms. Or the other option is Interbase. Now in Embarcadero own the Interbase database and we've done a lot of work to enable it to work on mobile platforms. Uh, and this is no small feat, especially when you consider that to have a database on a mobile device, um, for example, iOS does not allow you to have any external libraries. So you can't have any drivers that are outside your program. Everything's got to be completely compiled into your application. Interbase with Delphi and C++ Builder um, will allow you to compile straight into your application and run it out onto those platforms today. We have two versions. So we have IB Lite which is um, a, a lightly featured version. It doesn't have the security in it. However, it does provide you as software developers a foundation point that you can work on. And then we have Interbase to go, which is exactly the same as IB Lite, apart from the license files slightly different. And that enables different functionality within the database. Uh, it allows you to have more than 100 megs disk storage, uh, includes um, fully featured um, security features around 256 um, security uh, with encryption. So it really is kind of, if you want to offer the, the light edition of your products and then the professional edition, which includes all the security, um, you can do this with just a, well, with zero lines of code really, um, with Interbase to go. So Interbase really is the answer. Um, it has the same on-disk structure for Windows, for Mac, for iOS, 
for Android, for Linux and for Solaris. It means it's very easy and secure for data to be worked on on each of those devices, on each of those platforms. So as a developer, you can build and work with a database. You can play with encrypted data. You can then pass that directly onto an iOS or an Android device or deploy it out onto a, a laptop somewhere, knowing that data is secure. It gives your data administrators the chance to create databases that they want to use uh, as remote caches on different platforms as well. And they'll be able to check it out on their desktop machine and pass it to mobile devices very, very easily done. There's on-disk encryption built in to the to-go edition, the desktop edition, and the server edition. And this provides you the chance to use full 256 or a weaker 56-bit encryption. We have over-the-wire encryption if you're communicating to a remote server that uses OpenSSL. Interbase has a two-phase commit, so even if you pull the power out or the battery dies on a device at the point you're working with the database, it will restore itself automatically to a solid foundation point that's uncorrupted uh, uh, and you'll be ready to off and go. So it really is a true zero admin database. And it also has some self-optimization um, caching in there as well to ensure that it works very, very quickly. It has a tiny footprint. Um, we're talking a few meg for the whole core database engine. And it's fully embeddable for iOS and Android uh, and even on Windows and Mac as well. Interspace is very, very fast. It has um, uh, some, some core features built in that give it a very quick performance. And it's supporting all our major development platforms here. So you can find out more about Interspace at www.embarkadero.com forward slash products forward slash interface. Okay, so now it's time for us to get into some demos. Um, joining me for the demos, I've got Gabe Goldfield from the from the Interbase team. Hi, Gabe. Hi, Stephen. So first of all, let's um, let's have a quick look at uh, an example of Interbase running with some encryption uh, and how we're able to leverage this out onto to mobile. So quite simply here, we've got a, a mobile project that we can target out to both Android and iOS. And we can see here we've got some data showing for the HR employee. And um, this has the salary visible. But if we actually have a look here for the um, standard employee, then the data is not visible. And uh, this is actually, well, have a look. This is running the same queries, um, just with a slight difference in the connection string to do with the different username. Um, but other than that, everything that's controlling this data uh, and the visibility is managed at the column level within the uh, employee table uh, of this database. So just to show you here, we've got our, our two data connections. The HR employee has uh, the, the full name, salary from employee going back. And the, uh, the standard employee is exactly the same query, um, but we get the zeros back. So this is actually data controlled in the data level. And if we actually have a, a look at the parameters here on each of the, the database settings, here we can see we're using the, the HR employee. Uh, and on the other one, it's exactly the same. Uh, I'll actually put up the editor here, but we're, we're using the new employee as the, the data connection. So this is great. This actually really helps control the data. And not only we're able to use the users to prevent specific people seeing that data, but that data is actually encrypted on disk. And um, even if the, the database was stolen and somebody hacked into your phone, or um, if you had a, a customer who, or a, a client who'd uh, rooted their phone and hadn't told you about it, and there's big security holes there that people have to just copy files off, um, the data is actually encrypted and secured in the database, which is pretty cool. So. Let's have a quick look at the script that um, made this possible and what you need to run against your database to actually uh, create the user level encryption um, and talk a bit about um, how
how the different users exist, what the different types of roles they have, and uh, just kind of gives you a broad understanding really about what the, uh, the data encryption stuff can do um, and, uh, and how it works. So, Gabe, do you want to take us through the script? Sure, I'd love to. Um, this is a very simple script that we use to alter the employee database to uh, give different levels of encryption and decryption to different users. So in order to use encryption, the first thing you have to do is alter the database and add the admin option. You also need a sysdso user. The sysdso user will manage your encryptions. It's not necessarily the sysdba's job. The sysdba might not be someone that you want to see the data. It might just be your database administrator. So we created a an encryption administrator, sysdso. In this example, so this would be kind of ideal for somebody who's like a data controller in the organization who sets the uh, the rules around what you do with data. But this would be their, their login. They wouldn't be able to kind of modify the data, but they can actually set the security rights around exactly. the data. They can say new employees okay, that's pretty cool. can't see this. HR, we want you to see what you need to see, and vice versa. And different companies can have a variety of different roles. Um, in this example, we also wanted to show that in the same table, you can have different levels of encryption. Uh, in this example, we have the sales user is has a 256 AES, which is strong encryption. The uh, HR user has DES 56, which is our lowest. We call it weak encryption. So um, the flow of it, excuse me, the flow of it is to add the admin options, create your users, then you're going to create your encryptions, assign them to different roles, and then you're going to start uh, picking, in the example that Stephen just showed, we pick the salary. Uh, the HR employee can see the salary, the new employee can't. You could pick any field and assign it to a different role. It's probably better to assign it to a role than to specific users that can be hard to manage. So, so that means that um, if you've got a number of people in the HR department, you can all give them the same HR role. Yes. That makes it very easy. And also if you wanted to have, say, um, a, a somebody in the HR department also played a role in finance, you could give that to you could give them that role as well as a user? Yes, it's it's much like managing domains. Somebody might be involved in a few domains, but not uh, specifically just one. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, you know, that makes you know, the user security very flexible really, doesn't it? So yeah. that's cool. There's one other line that I want to talk about. Um, in the middle, we are creating a backup key. So the, the backup key is for backing up and restoring your database. And it needs to be, when you create this backup key, uh, if you use our tools, it will happen for you, like IB Console Wizard. But if you use it in a script like this, it needs to match the strongest encryption in that table or in that database. So in this example, we're using strong encryptions, 256 bits. If we were to choose a backup key weaker than the strongest encryption, then when it was time to uh, back up and restore, you wouldn't get all the data properly. Okay, so it's basically a will that you have what you can get, so you need to just make sure you're using the strongest one. Exactly. Okay, that's pretty cool. And, and obviously, this is a, an example where we're looking at um, controlling encryption at the column level on the database, because encryption has a slight overhead to it. But um, uh, in encrypting only the specific bits that we need to can can be quite a beneficial kind of from a performance point. But equally, if we just want to be, hey, it's not a massive database. There's not a lot of data in there. We want to just throw it all in quite happily. Or we've got super servers, and we're quite happy for it to encrypt and decrypt everything because it goes all the time. Um, you you can roll just full database encryption without having to worry about setting individual columns, yeah. can't you? Yes, you can. You can encrypt every database or just what you consider the security risks. And then, or as in this example, you can just say, I just want one column in this database that nobody can see. Cool. OK, so um, after we've set our, our backup password, um, what's the next thing that we do here? OK, in this example, uh, SysDBA is the database owner. It doesn't have to be. But the next thing you would do after you've created your encryption keys is allow the owner to set 
who can use these encryptions and what they're associated with. So we've been, we're granting the encryption option on to SysDBA for the backup key, the HR key, and the sales key. And in the next... Okay, so because we're connected as the, the, the data controller in essence, we need to allow the, the database administrator to allow access to other users mm -hmm. with that encryption. Exactly. Okay, cool. So now that we've granted the encryption option on to SysDBA, SysDBA can now alter the database and allow different users, different levels of encrypt and decrypt. So we're letting the HR key see the salary, and then we're setting the salary to zero as a default. So in the previous example, you saw new employees saw zero. It wasn't a null value, it was something that we chose. We could choose it to a million. We could. Hey, I wouldn't mind that salary. <laughs> exactly. <That's> salary. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty cool. So not only can we control what you see when you haven't got the rights, we're not stopping any scripts running um, when, from a developer point, we can just say, just put the same script in here. Even if you haven't got rights to, to run uh, and view that data, we'll give you the, the, the dummy empty value back that we define as a, as a company. So if it's a string field, you could put no access or something. Or, exactly. Restricted yeah. is something that we've commonly used for... Okay, cool. Okay, so that's pretty cool. We've, we're able to use here, we've got two different encryption keys on the same table, working on different columns, allowing different data to be seen by different users. So the, in this example, the HR department um, can see the salary, and the sales people can see the phone extensions. Uh, of the, uh, okay. Probably not the most real world example, but it's kind of useful to be able to see anyway. Um, but once we've... Um, once we've kind of got these encryptions in place and ready to, to roll, um, what's this uh, additional kind of line here for the vocal employee? Um, from well, in this computer? example, uh, the default employee database, which we use for many samples and examples, starts with grant all. And that's been going on for years and before the concept of encryptions. So in this example, we revoke all from public and then we re grant, select, insert, update, delete. But not encrypt or decrypt. And now the public, the normal user, is just like in the example, new employee, they can see what we want them to see. While um, since we, it still respects the encrypt and decrypt for the HR employee and sales user. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So it is possible to create um, a super user who's got grant tool on de uh, encryption, decryption stuff. Um, if you wanted to, uh, and then with other users, you can control specifically what they can see. Mm -hmm. You could do that with a key also, mm -hmm. grant every field to that key and then assign it to a user or a role. Okay, super. Thanks very much, Gabe. That's been really helpful um, to, to get an understanding about the sheer power uh, of what we can do with the, the encryption side of things. Um, and obviously, this is the most granular level down at the column level, um, but we could set up at a much higher level in just a couple of lines, you know, encrypting the whole database, um, which is typically what you probably want to do if you're deploying directly out onto to remote devices. Um, but this certainly gives you the, the flexibility to to use the, the right amount of encryption uh, with the data that you need to. If you've got a whole load of data that's not needed to be encrypted, then why waste the process of cycles on doing the encryption decryption, right? So, Okay, so I just want to finish off now with some uh, useful links that I found through uh, looking through getting this stuff pulled together. So the first slide I'd like to share with you is just a, uh, the ISO um, standards for information technology uh, data management. Um, so the systems management one's 27001, um, 2005 is the current draft, uh, which is going through some updates at the moment into the 2013 draft. But this looks at security techniques, uh, information security management and requirements. And uh, this certainly is uh, a specification that's worth um, being aware of if you're selling into especially larger organizations or if you work in a larger organization. And um, this really identifies the roles of the, um, the data processes and the 
um, and the data controllers uh, and, and looks into what they kind of do and how they bring the value back to the company. Also, a um, couple of key links really. The documentation on Interbase is excellent. Uh, if you go to docs.embarcadero.com, then you'll be able to find the link in there for the products for Interbase. And there's a whole uh, API user guide, um, developer guide, reference guide, language guide, and so on. There's, there's a whole set of language uh, and usage ref um, reference materials there. And also there's a nice example showing you how to build your first application up on DocWiki. Uh, if you run through docwiki.embarkadero.com, uh, you'll be able to find the Interbase database encryption in Rad Studio example. So really to summarize today's session, the world is going mobile. And wherever we have data going mobile, uh, or even you know, with our desktops and even in the offices, but anywhere data is, you need to worry about it. Security equals encryption. You need to get on disk encryption built into your applications so it doesn't matter where the data is, it's secure. And Interbring, Interbase brings you all of this on Windows, on Mac, on iOS, on Android, on Linux, and Solaris. So with Interbase on mobile, we've got IB Lite to get you started and then to move up to the to-go edition to bring in all the security levels. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be using Interbase in any mobile application uh, and then having the upgrade path and option available to you. So in short, go encrypt your data now. But first, some time for some Q&A. Sri Ram Balasubramanian, and I'm the engineering team lead uh, at Interbase. And I'm Gabe Goldfield, the uh, integration engineer for Interbase. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's get some questions queued up here. Can I use a client data set with external CDs files to maintain my data without using a database files or local storage in MySQL, etc., on Android or iOS? Well, you can use a, a client data set. Um, obviously, that will save down to um, the, the CDS format, or um, you can save it out to XML format. Um, they're fine if you've got some just a small little bit of data to store. Um, however, obviously, just remember uh, all the stuff that we've been talking about um, around um, business to business data. Um, you need to make sure the data is encrypted. Um, so if you're happy rolling your own 256 encryption um, and getting it up to kind of the, the right encryption standards um, around that data, then you, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't if it's a small amount of data. Just remember though that it will need to be a small amount of data because mobile devices don't really push a big punch around the memory. Um, so um, client data set is an in-memory data set. So if it's, if it's a very small amount of data, then you may be just about okay. Um, but certainly, you know, the best way is to, to get stuff um, into a, a proper data data space. Um, here's a question about how much is Interbase like to go licensing approximately? Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll answer one of the other questions that actually came in with this one as well. Um, with Delphi, um, if you buy the Enterprise Edition or above, uh, if you buy Rad Studio, uh, or if you uh, are buying the, the mobile packs to go along with the standalone Pro Edition, um, then you'll get a copy of IB Lite um, for use on the mobile platforms. Um, so um, you've got the free edition, uh, in essence, to, uh, which is a runtime royalty um, free edition there. Um, the Interbase to go edition, um, the best thing is uh, yeah, just give us a shout um, and we can have a chat with, uh, with your local sales rep around the pricing for it. Um, you know, it's it's a fraction of the cost of the server editions, um, uh, but there is still a, a kind of small cost there. But we need to kind of uh, help make sure we can give you the best pricing possible. Uh, so to do that, we need to talk to you directly. Um, but it's yeah, it's a it's a few dollars a seat, not hundreds of dollars a seat. So. Right. So yeah, it's a uh, you get the developer edition of IB to go, so you can test with it. But we, as soon as you need deployment, then yeah. Give them a shout and they'll uh, hook you up with a person. No, you, you can deploy with the IB Lite edition. Um, the difference between IB Lite and, uh, and To-Go edition, uh, IB Lite uh, is runtime royalty free, um, but it's limited to one connection to the database. Uh, it doesn't include the security uh, encryption element. 
um, but it does include the kind of the standard user security stuff uh, as as to go does, and also it has a limitation of 100 meg on disk. I'm sure maybe uh, add if there's anything other significant to to kind of highlight between the two. Um, but the the key thing there is that uh, rather than uh, uh, what's actually really quite nice is it gives you the chance to be able to deploy a a light edition and then a a, a pro edition of your software um, that uh, one brings you extra value in because you're able to offer extra value out to the customer. Um, with the with the encryption stuff in there, uh, and then give the customer the choice to decide uh, about what they want, and not limit yourself with your with your development time really about enforcing that encryption side of things. Uh, I would just add on to that and uh, mention uh, that there's a DocWiki article uh, detailing the differences between IB Lite and IB to go. Uh, Jim, maybe we can we can search for the DocWiki article and uh, post that link. Uh, IB Lite is, has all the database capabilities. When, uh, one thing is Steven already alluded to that, but IB Lite currently is available for distribution only on the mobile platforms. Uh, that's on iOS and Android, uh, and it's royalty free. Uh, so you can uh, build your applications with uh, Rad Studio and Delphi and uh, deploy to the mobile platforms with the embedded database in there with all the capabilities. Um, where IB to go differs from IB Lite is in the areas of encryption and scalability. So IB2Go has no restrictions on number of simultaneous uh, transactions that can be started, whereas IB Lite has some restrictions on the uh, this one connection and one transaction for the application that can run at one time. Uh, there is uh, another uh, thing that makes it easy for you to choose whether you want to use IB Lite or IB2Go uh, in that both are binary compatible. Uh, when, once the application is built, it is your choice whether you want to put an IB Lite license in there or IB to go license. You don't have to make any, you don't have to rebuild your product or have to make any source code changes on that front. Uh, so it's binary compatible. Uh, you make a choice how you want to deploy your application with the royalty free IB Lite or uh, you need, you want to use additional capabilities that IB to go brings uh, and uh, thus there's a royalty payment attached to that. And, and of course, IB2Go also is cross-platform, so you can have the same application run on Windows and des uh, Mac OS desktops as well with IB2Go embedded. Yeah, there's um, there's also a couple of questions here around the encryption side of things. This is one of the the major benefits for developers with Interbase is not only have we got all this powerful encryption stuff that we can add in, but as it uses the same on-disk structure, um, you can build, you can test and debug. Um, with your database, with your setup uh, on your on your Windows machine, uh, on your Android machine, on your iOS machine, uh, and you can put the same data file um, straight onto any device uh, and work with it. And the data, the the, the key thing here um, is that the encryption is inside the database. So you know, if you take um, kind of a an unencrypted database, be it uh, an InSpace one or a Firebird one or um, well, any any data files that are unencrypted, you can literally just right click, open a notepad, and you can see clear text data in there. Um, so if you're storing things like national insurance numbers or uh, social security numbers, um, things that uh, you know governments get very touchy about um, about your storing, um, if it's not encrypted, then that's a clear identifier to a specific person. Um, so you're then in the, the territory of ending up with a, a whopping phone. Um, but with Interbase, when you've got the encryption turned on, um, be it on the table or on the column or on the entire data file, that data that you specified will be encrypted. So you can try and view it in Notepad all you want. You're just not going to be able to read or understand anything that's there. Um, so you know, uh, this is a, a very, very useful thing um, uh, around the data encryption side because it doesn't matter if that data file gets pulled off and put somewhere else, the data is still encrypted at the end of the day. As Steven mentioned earlier, IB Lite has no encryption support. Uh, for that, you have to use IB, IB2Go. Uh, one more aspect of what IB2Go brings, since it has encryption built in for data that is at rest, uh, there is also encryption capabilities for client-server communication using SSL. Mm -hmm. Um, IP2Go applications that are running on mobile devices uh, can have an encrypted uh, tunnel to a remote interface server running on a Windows or a Linux server for that matter. Uh, 
uh, whereas IV Lite applications that are running on the device can still reach out to remote servers uh, where databases are hosted, um, but they cannot have that as an encrypted uh, communication link. So that's again uh, in the open. So that's from an encryption perspective, that's that's a, a differentiation that you should know about too, that IB2Go brings strength for data that is at rest as well as data that's in transit. Okay, so here's a question that says, if the iOS data protection that is now enabled by default, or is that adequate to protect databases deployed with Delphi apps to iOS 7 devices? Um, well, as we saw as we went through the, um, the video here, um, you know, having a, a pin code to protect the device is not considered um, enough security. Um, and quite often, if you want to access and remove data from devices, um, you don't need much more than that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a help for sure. It's a good help. Um, but if you've got the, the pin code uh, or the access code for that device, then it's no help whatsoever. You know, it, it's great that that kind of stuff there and is, and is supporting, but um, would, you be, you know, would you be willing to risk your house against it? But, you know. I would probably just add on to that and say there are probably four different levels of data protection that you can provide. Uh, one, of course, the platform itself, like what you mentioned, is iOS 7 provides data protection capabilities. And then there is uh, application in your application you can build in your own uh, encryption uh, that's you know some provide some kind of obscurity uh, and then you can use of course the database level encryptions um, the simplest form of database level encryption of course is uh, you just encrypt the whole database file uh, you don't need to if you're not concerned about specific users getting access to specific columns um, your interest is only to protect the whole database file then all you need to do, uh, Stephen and Gabe talked about the SQL script that you use to set up encryption. Uh, you can pretty much take out a lot of those commands if you're just interested in encrypting the whole database file. All you need to do is create one encryption key and assign it to the database. Uh, in that case, any user that's allowed to get access to the database files can uh, look at the data as, as per the SQL security uh, definitions. Uh, as per the rule allows, uh, but once that if the database file is compromised, as it is copied elsewhere, it still cannot be used by. Um, you cannot use editors uh, like Stephen mentioned, like Notepad, and look into the data. It still encrypts your whole database file. Um, if IB Lite is free, can we download it if our client, if they don't, if we're not using XC5 or don't own XC5? Uh, the license for it comes with um, with. Uh, with the rad tools now, so you, you need to buy the rad tools to be able to get hold of a copy. Yes, uh, Rad Studio. I mean, your question was specific to XC5, so I'll just add on one comment out there to say, IB Lite was first introduced in Rad Studio XC4, but at that time we introduced support only for iOS. Uh, so if you are using Rad Studio XC4, you can still use IB Lite, but you'll only be able to deploy your applications to iOS with IB Lite. Uh, for getting both iOS and Android support. Uh, RAS Studio XC5 is the only choice. Uh, how do IB Light and IB2Go control concurrent connections? Is there a program or service running in the background like Interbase Guardian on mobile platforms? No. Um, in this particular case, I mean, since you are specifically about Interbase Guardian, uh, for IB2Go and IB Light, both of them are embedded databases within your process within your application process. So there is no separate server that's running to do concurrency operations. Um, your application has full control over your database file. So IB Lite and IB2Go, since they are binary compatible, they share the same database engine. Uh, because of the licensing limitations that IB Lite has, it only allows one connection to a database, and it only allows one user-level transaction. Uh, IB2Go, on the other hand, uh, allows multiple connections uh, to uh, different databases and it also allows multiple transactions that can be run simultaneously but the whole database engine uh, module is built in with your application it's embedded with your application uh, if we want to create mobile applications to connect to legacy databases what can we do about encryption okay so to to connect from mobile um, you can either use data snap to connect back to it um, which is in the enterprise editions of, of the rad tools or um, you can actually 
um, use the IB lights uh, or the IB to go um, clients to make a connection back to um, an interface database. I'm sure I might want to just kind of mention about which um, which versions we support there. Um, but uh, but in short, you can communicate across a network um, with with uh, using Interspace as a, a local client, um, in essence. Um, the only thing really in practice, um, it's probably quite rare you'd see that unless you're inside the firewall, because um, I'm not sure many DBAs would want to open up their, their database ports to the outside world, um, which is where really kind of things like data snap really come, come into their own to, to give you that protection layer. And then a question about performance between SQLite and IB Lite and IBDO. Um, yeah, I know. I know there has been a, a few tests run. Um, uh, one of the FIDAC developers ran some speed tests against SQLite and IB um, Lite, and um, so you know there, there really wasn't a huge amount um, in the speed difference. Um, uh, I think the interface stuff was slightly faster uh, at times. Um, but it really depends what you're trying to do with it, and it's some very limited tests. So I certainly wouldn't say it's been extensive testing that I'm aware of. I don't know if Shrooms had any other stuff that's been done. Thank you very much, Stephen. And yes, mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, bye. Thank you.